The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Volume 1, Cosmogenesis. Part 2, The Evolution of Symbolism in its Approximate Order, with Explanatory Sections. Section 9, The Moon, Deus Lunus, Ferbe. This archaic symbol is the most poetical of all symbols as also the most philosophical. The ancient Greeks brought it into a prominence, and the modern poets have worn it threadbare. The Queen of Night, riding in the majesty of her peerless light in heaven, throwing all, even Hesperos, into darkness, and spreading her silver mantle over the whole sidereal world, has ever been a favorite theme with all the poets of Christendom from Milton and Shakespeare down to the latest versifier. But the refulgent lamp of night, with a suite of stars unnumbered, spoke only to the imagination of the profane. Until lately, religion and science had naught to do with the beautiful mythos. Yet the cold chaste moon, she, in the words of Shelley, quote, who makes all beautiful on which she smiles, that wandering shrine of soft yet icy flame, which ever is transformed, yet still the same, and warms, but not illuminous, unquote. stands in closer relations to earth than any other sidereal orb. The sun is the giver of life to the whole planetary system. The moon is the giver of life to our globe, and the early races understood and knew it, even in their infancy. She is the queen, and she is the king and was King Soma before she became transformed into Ferbe and the chaste Diana. She is preeminently the deity of the Christians through the Mosaic and Kabbalistic Jews, though the civilized world may have remained ignorant of the fact for long ages, in fact, ever since the last initiated father of the church died, carrying with him into his grave the secrets of the pagan temples. For the, quote, fathers, unquote, such as Oregon or Clemens Alexandrinus, the moon was Jehovah's living symbol, the giver of life and the giver of death, the disposer of being in our world. For if Artemis was Luna in heaven, and, with the Greeks, Diana on earth, who presided of childbirth and life, with the Egyptians she was Hecate, Hecate in hell the goddess of death, who ruled over magic and enchantments. More than this, as a personified moon whose phenomena are triadic, Diana Hectiluna is the three in one. For she is diva triformis, tergemina, triceps, three heads on one neck, like Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Note, the goddess Trimorphos in the stature of Alcamenus. End of note. Hence she is the prototype of our trinity, which has not always been entirely male. The number seven, so prominent in the Bible, so sacred in its seventh Sabbath day, came to the Jews from antiquity, deriving its origin from the fourfold number seven contained in the 28 days of the lunar month, each septenary portion thereof being typified by one quarter of the moon. It is worth the trouble of presenting in this work a bird's-eye view of the origin and development of the lunar myth and worship in historical antiquity on our side of the globe. Its early origin is untraceable by exact science, rejecting as it does tradition, while for theology, which, under the guidance of the crafty popes, has put a brand on every fragment of literature that does not bear the imprimatur of the Church of Rome, its archaic history is a sealed book. Whether the Egyptian or the Aryan Hindu religious philosophy is the more ancient, and the secret doctrine says it is the latter, does not much matter in this instance, as the lunar and solar, quote, worship, unquote, or the most ancient in the world. Both have survived and prevail to this day throughout the whole world, with some openly, with others, for example, in Christian symbolics, secretly. The cat, a lunar symbol, was sacred to Isis, 
herself the moon in one sense, as Osiris was the sun. The cat is often seen on top of the sistrum, in the hand of the goddess. This animal was held in great veneration in the city of Bubaste, which went into deep mourning after the death of every sacred cat, because Isis, as the moon, was particularly worshipped in this city of mysteries. The astronomical symbolism connected with it has already been given in section 1 of the symbolism, and no one has better described it than Mr. G. Massey in his lectures and in The Natural Genesis. The eye of the cat, it is said, seems to follow the lunar phases in its growth and decline, and its orbs shine like two stars in the darkness of night, hence the mythological allegory which shows Diana hiding under the shape of a cat in the moon, when in company with other deities she was seeking to escape the pursuit of Typhon. Vide the Metamorphosis of Ovid. The moon in Egypt was both the eye of Horus and the eye of Osiris, the sun. The same with the Cynocephalus. The dog-headed ape was a glyph to symbolize the sun and moon, in turn, though the Cynocephalus is more a hermetic than a religious symbol. For it is the hieroglyph of Mercury, the planet, as of the Mercury of the alchemical philosophers, as Say the alchemists, Mercury has to be ever near Isis as a minister, as without Mercury neither Isis nor Osiris can accomplish anything in the great work. Cynocephalus, whenever represented with the caduceus, the crescent or the lotus, is a glyph of the philosophical Mercury, but when seen with a reed or a roll of parchment, he stands for Hermes, the secretary and adviser of Isis, as Hanuman filled the same office with Rama. Though the regular sun worshippers, the Parsis, are few, yet not only is the bulk of the Hindu mythology and history based upon and interblended with these two worships, but so is also the Christian religion itself. From their origin down to our modern day it has coloured the theologies of both the Roman Catholic and Protestant churches. The difference indeed between the Aryan Hindu and the Aryan European faiths is very small, if only the fundamental ideas of both are taken into consideration. Hindus are proud of calling themselves Suryas and Chandravanses of the solar and lunar dynasties. The Christians pretend to regard it as idolatry, and yet they adhere to a religion entirely based upon the solar and lunar worships. It is useless and vain for the Protestants to exclaim against the Roman Catholics for their, quote, Mariolatry, unquote, based on the ancient cult of lunar goddesses, which they themselves worship Jehovah, preeminently a lunar god, and when both churches have accepted in their theologies their, quote, Son Christ, unquote, and the lunar trinity. What is known of Chaldean moon worship, of the Babylonian god, Sin, called by the Greeks Deus Lunus, is very little, and that little is apt to mislead the profane student who fails to grasp the esoteric significance of the symbols. As a popular known to the ancient profane philosophers and writers, for those who were initiated were pledged to silence, the Chaldea were the worshippers of the moon under her and his, various names, just as were the Jews who came after them. In the unpublished manuscripts on the art speech already mentioned, giving a key to the formation of the ancient symbolical language, a logical raison d'être is brought forward for this double worship. It is written by a wonderfully well-informed and acute scholar and mystic who gives it in the comprehensive form of a hypothesis. The latter, however, becomes forcibly a proven fact in the history of religious evolution in human thought to anyone who has ever had a glimpse into the secret of ancient symbology. Thus he says, quote, One of the first occupations among men connected with those of actual necessity would be the perception of time periods marked on the vaulted arc of the heavens sprung and rising over the level floor of the horizon or the plain of still water. Note, 
ancient mythology includes ancient astronomy as well as astrology. The planets were the hands pointing out on the dial of our solar system the hours of certain periodical events. Thus, Mercury was the messenger appointed to keep time during the daily solar and lunar phenomena, and was otherwise connected with the god and goddess of light. End of note. These would come to be marked as those of day and night, of the phases of the moon, of its stellar or synodic revolutions, and of the period of the solar year, with recurrence of the seasons, and with application to such periods of the natural measure of day or night, or of the day divided into the light and the dark. It would also be discovered that there was the longest and shortest solar day, and two solar days of equal day and night within the period of the solar year, and the points in the year of these could be marked with the greatest precision in the starry groups of the heavens or their constellations, subject to that retrograde movement thereof, which in time would require correction by intercalation, as was the cause in the description of the flood, where a correction of 150 days was made for a period of 600 years, during which confusion of landmarks had increased. This would naturally come to pass with all races in all time, and such knowledge must be taken to have been inherent in the human race prior to what we call the historic period. End of quote. On this basis, the author seeks for some natural physical function possessed in common with the human race and connected with the periodical manifestations, such that the connection between the two kinds of phenomena became fixed in popular usage. He finds it a. In feminine physiological phenomena every lunar month of 28 days or four weeks of seven days each, so that 13 occurrences of the period should happen in 364 days, which is the solar week year of 52 weeks of 7 days each. b. The quickening of the fetus is marked by a period of 126 days, or 18 weeks of 7 days each. c. That period which is called the period of viability is one of 210 days or 30 weeks of 7 days each. d. The period of parturition is accomplished in 280 days or a period of 40 weeks of 7 days each or 10 lunar months of 28 days each or of 9 calendar months of 31 days each counting on the royal arc of heavens for the measure of the period of traverse from the darkness of the womb to the light and glory of conscious existence, that continuing inscrutable mystery and miracle. Thus the observed periods of time marking the workings of the birth function would naturally become a basis of astronomical calculation we may almost affirm that this was the mode of reckoning among all nations, either independently or intermediately and indirectly by tuition. It was the mode with the Hebrews, for even today they calculate the calendar by means of the 354 and 355 of the lunar year, and we possess a special evidence that it was the mode with the ancient Egyptians, as to which this is the proof. Quote, the basic idea underlying the religious philosophy of the Hebrews was that God contained all things within himself. Note, a caricatured and warped Vedantin notion of Parabrahman containing within itself the whole universe as being that boundless universe itself, and there existing nothing outside of itself. End of note. And that man was his image, the place of the man and woman, with the Hebrews was among the Egyptians occupied by the bull and the cow, sacred to Osiris and Isis, who were represented respectively by a man having a bull's head and a woman having the head of a cow, which symbols were worshipped. Note, just as they are to this day in India, the bull of Shiva and the cow representing several Shakti goddesses. End of note. 
Notoriously, Osiris was the sun and the river Nile, the tropical year of 365 days, which numbers the value of the word Nalos, and the bull, as he was also the principle of fire and of the bed of the river Nile, or the mother earth. For the parturient energies of which water was a necessity, the lunar year of 354 to 364 days, the time maker of the periods of gestation, and the cow marked by or with the crescent new moon. But the use of the cow of the Egyptians for the women of the Hebrews was not intended as of any radical difference of signification, but a concurrence in the teaching intended and merely a substitution of a symbol of common import, which was this, meaning the period of parturition with the cow and the woman was held to be the same, or 280 days, or 10 lunar months and 4 weeks each. And in this period consisted the essential value of this animal symbol, whose mark was that of the crescent moon. Note. Hence the worship of the moon by the Hebrews. End of note. These parturient and natural periods are found to have been subjects of symbolism all over the world. They were thus used by the Hindus, and are found to be most plainly set forth by the ancient Americans in the Richardson and Jest tablets in the Palenque Cross, and manifestly lay at the base of the formation of the calendar forms of the Mayas, of Yucatan, the Hindus, the Assyrians, and the ancient Babylonians, as well as the Egyptians and Old Hebrews. The natural symbols would be either the phallus or the phallus anioni, or male and female. Indeed, the words translated by the generalizing terms male and female in the 27th verse of the first chapter of Genesis are sacre and nkabrach, or literally phallus and yoni. Note, male and female created he them. End of note. Why the representation of the phallic emblems would barely indicate the genital members of the human body when their functions and the development of the seed vesicles emanating from them was considered. Then would come into indication a mode of measures of lunar time and through lunar of solar time. End of quote. This is the physiological or anthropological key to the moon symbol. The key that opens the mystery of theogony or the evolution of the monumentary gods is more complicated and has nothing phallic in it. All is mystical and divine there, but the Jews, beyond connecting Jehovah directly with the moon as a generative god, preferred to ignore the higher hierarchies and have made of some of them zodiacal constellations and planetary gods their patriarchs thus humorizing the purely theosophical idea and dragging it down into the level of sinful humanity. See section Holy of Holies and the Symbolism of Book 2. The manuscripts from which the above is extracted explains very clearly to what hierarchy of God's Jehovah belonged and who this Jewish God was. For it shows in clear language that which the writer has always insisted upon, namely, that the God with which the Christians have burdened themselves was no better than the lunar symbol of the reproductive or generative faculty in nature. They have ever ignored even the Hebrew secret God of the Kabbalists, Ein Sof, as grand as Parabramam in the earliest Kabbalistic and mystical conceptions. But it is not the Kabbalah of Rosenroth that can ever give the true original teachings of Simeon ben Yochai as metaphysical and philosophical as any. And how many are there among the students of the Kabbalah who knew anything of them except in their distorted Latin translations? Let us glance at the idea which led the ancient Jews to adopt a substitute for the ever unknowable, and which has misled the Christians into mistaking the substitute for the reality. Quote, if to these organs, phallus and yoni, as symbols of creative cosmic agencies, the idea of time period can be attached, 
than indeed in the construction of temples as dwellings of deity or of Jehovah. That post designated as the Holy of Holies or the Most High Place should borrow its title from the recognized sacredness of the generative organs considered as symbols of measures as well as of creative cause. With the ancient wise there was no name and no idea and no symbol of a first cause. Note, because it was too sacred, it is referred to as a that in the Vedas. It is the eternal cause and cannot therefore be spoken of as a first cause, a term implying the absence of any cause at one time. End of note. With the Hebrews, the indirect conception of such was couched in a term of negation of comprehension, meaning Ainsof, or the without bounds. But the symbol of its first comprehensible manifestation was the conception of a circle with its diameter line. See the probe of Book 1, Part 1. To carry at once a geometric, phallic and astronomic idea. For the one takes its birth from the naught, or the circle, without which it could not be, and from one, or primal one, spring the nine digits, and, geometrically, all plane shapes. So in the Kabbalah, this circle, with its diameter line, is the picture of the ten sephiroth, or emanations, composing the Adam Kadman, the archetypal man, the creative origin of all things. This idea of connecting the circle and its diameter line, that is, number ten, with the signification of the reproductive organs and the most holy place, was carried out constructively in the king's chamber, or holy of holies, of the great pyramid, in the tabernacle of Moses, and in the holy of holies of the temple of Solomon. It is the picture of a double womb, for in Hebrew, the letter He is at the same time the number five, and symbol of the womb, and twice five is ten, or the phallic number. This double womb also shows the duality of the idea carried from the highest spiritual down to the lowest, or terrestrial plane, and by the Jews limited to the latter. With them, therefore, the number seven has acquired the most prominent place in their exoteric religion, a cult of external forms and empty rituals, as their Sabbath, for instance, the seventh day sacred to their deity, the moon, symbolical of the generative Jehovah. While with other nations, the number seven was typical of theogonic evolution, of cycles, cosmic planes, and the seven forces and occult powers of the cosmos, as a boundless whole whose first upper triangle was unreachable to the finite intellect of man, while other nations therefore busied themselves in the forcible limitation of cosmos in space and time only with its septenary manifested plane. The Jews centered this member solely in the moon and based all their sacred calculations thereupon. Hence we find the thoughtful author of the manuscripts just quoted remarking in reference to the metrology of the Jews that, quote, If 20,612 be multiplied by 4 divided by 3, the product will afford a base for the ascertainment of the mean revolution of the moon. And if this product be again multiplied by 4 thirds, this continued product will afford a base for finding the exact period of the mean solar year. This form, becoming for the finding of astronomical periods of time, of very great service. Unquote. This double number, male and female, is symbolized also in some well-known idols. For example, Ardana Ishvara, the Isis of the Hindus, Eridanus or Ardan or the Hebrew Jordan, or source of descent. She is standing on a lotus leaf flowing on the water, but the signification is that it is androgyne or hermaphrodite, that is phallus and yoni combined, the number ten, the Hebrew letter Jod, the containment of Jehovah. She, or rather she, he, gives the minutes of the same circle of 360 degrees. 
Jehovah in its best aspect is Bina, the upper mediating mother, the great sea or Holy Spirit, therefore rather a synonym of Mary, the mother of Jesus, than of his father. That mother, being the Latin mare, the sea, is here also Venus, the stella del mare, or star of the sea. The ancestors of the mysterious Arcadians, the Chandra or Indovansas, the lunar kings whom tradition shows reigning at Prayag, Allahabad, ages before our era, had come from India, and brought with them the worship of their forefathers, of Soma and his son Buda, which afterwards became that of the Chaldeans. Yet such adoration, apart from popular astrology and heliolatry, was in no sense idolatry, no more at any rate than the modern Roman Catholic symbolism which connects their Virgin Mary, the Magna Mater of the Syrians and Greeks, with the moon. Of this worship the most pious Roman Catholics feel quite proud and loudly confess to it. In a memoir to the French Academy, the Marquis de Merville says, It is only natural that, as an unconscious prophecy, Amun Ra should be his mother's husband, since the Magna Mater of the Christians is precisely the spouse of that son she conceives. We, Christians, can understand now why Natis throws radiance on the sun while remaining the moon, since the Virgin, who is the Queen of Heaven, as Nith was, clothes herself in her radiance and clothes in his turn the Christ's son. Tu vestis solem et te sol vestit is sung by the Roman Catholics during their service. And he adds, We, Christians, understand also how it is that the famous inscription at Sais should have stated that none has ever lifted my peplum, veil, considering that this sentence literally translated is the summary of what is sung in the church on the day of the Immaculate Conception. Archaeology of the Virgin Mother, page 117. Surely nothing could be more sincere than this. It justifies entirely what Mr. Gerald Massey has said in his lecture on Lunolatry, Ancient and Modern. Quote, The man in the moon, author is Sut, Jehovah Satan, Christ Judas, and other lunar twins, is often charged with bad conduct. In the lunar phenomena, the moon was one as the moon, which was twofold in sex and threefold in character, as mother, child, and adult male. Thus the child of the moon became the consort of his own mother. It could not be helped if there was to be any reproduction. He was compelled to be his own father. These relationships were repudiated by later sociology and the primitive man in the moon got tabooed. Yet in its latest, most inexplicable phase, this has become the central doctrine of the grossest superstition the world has seen, for these lunar phenomena and their humanly represented relationships, the incestuous included, are the very foundations of the Christian trinity in unity. Through ignorance of the symbolism, the simple representation of early time has become the most profound religious mystery in modern lunolatry. The Roman Church, without being in any wise ashamed of the proof, portrays the Virgin Mary arrayed with the sun and the horned moon at her feet, holding the lunar infant in her arms as a child and consort of the mother moon. The mother, child and adult male are fundamental. End of quote. Quote, in this way it can be proved that our Christology is mummified mythology and legendary lore, which have been palmed off upon us in the Old Testament and the New as divine revelation uttered by the very voice of God. Unquote. A charming allegory is found in the Zohar, one which unveils better than anything ever did the true character of Jehovah or Yehaviha in the primitive conception of the Hebrew Kabbalists. It is now found in the philosophy of Ibn Gibral's Kabbalah, translated by Isaac Meyer. In the introduction written by Reis Kiyah, which is very old, says the author, and forms part of our broad edition of the Zohar, 1, 5b, sequence, is an account of a journey taken by R. Elazar, 
son of Ashimob Yoa, and Rabbi Abba. They meet a man with a heavy burden and asked his name, but he refused to give it and proceeded to explain to them Torah, law. They asked, Who caused thee thirst to walk and carry such a heavy load? He answered, The letter Yod, which equals ten, and is the symbolical letter of Kether and the essence and germ of the holy name, Yahweh. They said to him, If thou wilt tell us the name of thy father, we will kiss the dust of thy feet. He replied, As to my father, he had his dwelling in the great sea, and was a fish therein, like Vishnu and dragon or Oanes, which first destroyed the great sea. And he was great and mighty and ancient of days, until he swallowed all other fishes in the great sea. Arelazar listened and said to him, Thou art the son of the holy flame, thou art the son of Rabham, Nunna, Saba, the old, the fish in Aramaic, or Keldi, is none, Nun. Thou art the son of the light of the Torah, Dharma, etc. Then the author explains that the feminine Sephiroth, Bina, is termed by the Kabbalist the Great Sea. Therefore Bina, whose divine names are Jehovah, Yah, and Elohim, is simply the Chaldean Tiamat, the female power, the Talat of Berosus, who presides over the chaos, and which made out later by Christian theology to be the serpent and the devil. She, he, Yahovah, is the supernatural, he and Eve. This Yehovah, then, or Jehovah, is identical with our chaos father, mother, son, on the material plane and in the purely physical world. Demon and Deus at one at the same time. The sun and moon, good and evil, God and demon. Lunar magnetism generates life, preserves and destroys it, psychically as well as physically. And if, astronomically, she is one of the seven planets of the ancient world, in Theogony she is one of the regions thereof. With Christians now, as much as with pagans, the former referring to her under the name of one of their archangels, and the latter under that of one of their gods. Therefore, the meaning of the, quote, fairy tale, unquote, translated by Chovson from an old Chaldean manuscript, translated into Arabic about Kuchami being instructed by the idol of the moon, is easily understood. Vide Book 3. Seldonus tells us the secret, as well as Memonid, Moranevachim, Book 3, Chapter 30. The worshippers of the Teraphim, the Jewish oracles, carved images and claimed that the light of the principal stars, the planets, permeating these through and through, the angelic virtues, or the regions of the stars and planets, conversed with them, teaching them many most useful things and arts. Unquote. And Seldonus explains that the teraphim were built and composed after the possession of certain planets, those which the Greeks called Stoicheia, and according to figures that were located in the sky and called Alexiteroi, or the tutelary gods. Those who traced out the Stoicheia were called Stoicheomatikoi, or the diviners by the Stoicheia. From Dedis Sudis Teraf, volume 2, page 31, Vidinfa, the Teraphim. It is in such sentences, however, in the Nabathean agriculture, that have frightened the men of science and made them proclaim the work either an apocrypha or a fairy tale unworthy of the notice of an academician. At the same time, as shown, zealous Roman Catholics and Protestants tore it metaphorically to pieces, the former because it described the worship of demons, the latter because it is ungodly. They are all wrong once more. It is not a fairy tale, and as far as regards pious churchmen, the same worship may be shown in the scriptures, however disfigured by translation. 
Solar and lunar worship, as well as that of the stars and elements, are traced and figure in the Christian theology. Defended by papists, they are stoutly denied by the Protestants only at their own risk and peril. Two instances may be given. Amanius Marcellinus teaches that ancient divinations were always accomplished with the help of the spirits of the elements. Spiritus Elementorum, and in Greek, Pneumata ton Stoicheon. But it is found now that the planets, the elements, and the zodiac were figured not only in Heliopolis by the twelve stones called Mysteries of the Elements, Elementorum Arcana, but also in a Solomon's Temple, and, as pointed out by various writers, in several old Italian churches, and even at Notre-Dame de Paris, where they can be seen to this day. No symbol, the sun included, was more complex in its manifold meanings than the lunar symbol. The sex was, of course, dual. With the summit was male, for example the Hindu king Soma and the Chaldean Sin. With other nations it was female, the beauteous goddess Diana Luna, Elithia, Lucina. In Tauris human victims were sacrificed to Artemis, a form of the lunar goddess. The Cretans called her Dictina, and the Medes and Persians Anaitis, as shown by an inscription of Coloe, Artemidi Anaiti. But we are now concerned chiefly with the most chaste and pure of the virgin goddesses, Luna Artemis, to whom Pamphos was the first to give the surname of Caliste, and of whom Hippolytus wrote, Calista Polu Parfenon. See Pausanias, chapter 8, verses 35 and 8. This Artemis Lochia, the goddess that presided at conception and childbirth, see Iliad, Pausanias, etc., etc., is, in her functions, and as the triple hectate, the Orphic deity, the predecessor of the god of the rabbins and pre-Christian Kabbalists, and his lunar type. The goddess Trimorphos was the personified symbol of the various and successive aspects represented by the moon in each of her three phases, and this interpretation was already that of the Stoics, while the Orphans explained the epithet Trimorphos by the three kingdoms of nature over which she reigned, jealous, bloodthirsty, revengeful and exacting. Hectate Luna is a worthy counterpart of the, quote, jealous God, unquote, of the Hebrew prophets. The whole riddle of the solar and lunar worship, as now traced in the churches, hangs indeed on this world-old mystery of lunar phenomena, the correlative forces in the Queen of Night, that lie latent for modern science, but are fully active to the knowledge of Eastern adepts, explain well the thousand and one images under which the moon was represented by the ancients. It also shows how much more profoundly learned in the Selenic mysteries were the ancients than are now our modern astronomers. The whole pantheon of the lunar gods and goddesses, Nephis or Neith, Proserpina, Melitta, Sibele, Isis, Astarte, Venus and Hectate on the one hand, and Apollo, Dionysius, Adonis, Bacchus, Osiris, Artus, Tammuz, etc., etc., on the other, all show on the face of their names and titles those of sons and husbands of their mothers, their identity with the Christian trinity. In every religious system, the gods were made to merge their functions as father, son, and husband into one and the goddesses were identified as a wife, mother, and sister of the male god, the former synthesizing the human attributes as the son, the giver of life, the latter merging all the other titles in the grand synthesis known as Maya, Maya, Maria, etc., a generic name. Maya, in its false derivation, has come to mean with the Greeks mother, from the root ma, nurse, and even gave its name to the month of May, 
which was sacred to all those goddesses before it became consecrated to Mary. Note, the Roman Catholics are indebted for the idea of consecrating the month of May to the Virgin, to the pagan Plutarch, who shows that May is sacred to Maya, Maia, or Vesta, Alus Gellus, word Maya, our Mother Earth, or Nurse, and Nourisher, personified. End of note. Its primitive meaning, however, was Maya, Durga, translated by the Orientalist as inaccessible, but meaning in truth the unreachable, in the sense of illusion and unreality, as being the source and cause of spells, the personification of illusion. In religious rites, the moon served a dual purpose. Personified as a female goddess for exoteric purposes, or as a male god in allegory and symbol, in occult philosophy our satellite was regarded as a sexless potency to be well studied, because it was to be dreaded. With the initiated Aryans, Chaldi, Greeks and Romans, Soma, Sin, Artemis, Soteira, the hermaphrodite Apollo, whose attribute is the lyre, and the bearded Diana of the bow and arrow, Deus Lunus, and especially Osiris Lunus and Thot Lunus, were the occult potencies of the moon. Note, Thot Lunus is Buddha Soma of India, or Mercury and the moon, end of note. But whether male or female, whether Thot or Minerva, Soma or Astoreth, the moon is the occult mystery of mysteries, and more a symbol of evil than of good. Her seven phases, in original esoteric division, are divided into three astronomical phenomena and four purely psychic phases. That the moon was not always reverenced is shown in the mysteries in which the death of the moon god, the three phases of gradual waning and final disappearance, was allegorized by the moon standing for the genius of evil that triumphs for the time over the light and life-giving God, the sun, and all the skill and learning of the ancient hierophants in magic was required to turn this triumph into a defeat. It was the most ancient worship of all, that of the third race of our round, the hermaphrodites, to whom the male moon became sacred, when, after the fall, so-called, the sexes had become separated. Deus Lunus then became an androgyne, male and female in turn, to serve finally for purposes of sorcery as a dual power to the fourth root race, the Atlanteans. With the fifth, our own, the lunar solar worship divided the nations into two distinct antagonistic camps. It led to events described aeons later in the Mahabharatan war, which to the Europeans is fabulous, to the Hindus and occultists the historical, strife between the Suryavansas and the Indovansas. Originating in the dual aspect of the moon, the worship of the female and the male principles respectively, it ended in distinct solar and lunar cults. Among the Semitic races, the sun was for a very long time feminine and the moon masculine, the latter notion being adopted by them from the Atlantean traditions. The moon was called the lord of the sun, Bel Semesh before the Semesh worship. Note, during that period which is absent from the Mosaic books, from the exile of Eden to the allegorical flood, the Jews worshipped with the rest of the Semites, Dionysi, the ruler of men, the judge or the son. Though the Jewish Canaan and Christianism have made the Son become the Lord God and Jehovah in the Bible, yet the latter is full of indiscreet traces of the androgyne deity, which was Jehovah the Son, and Astoreth the Moon in its female aspect, and quite free from the present metaphorical element given to it. God is a consuming fire, appears in, and is encompassed by fire. It was not only in vision that Ezekiel, chapter 8, verse 16, 
saw the Jews worshipping the sun, the Baal of the Israelites, the Shemes of the Moabites, and the Moloch of Ammonites, was the identical son Jehovah, and he is till now the king of the host of heaven. The sun, as much as Astareth, was the queen of heaven, or the moon. The son of righteousness has become a metaphorical expression only now. End of note. The ignorance of the incipient reasons for such a distinction and of cult principles led the nations into anthropomorphic idol worship. But the religion of every ancient nation had been primarily based upon the occult manifestations of a purely abstract force or principle now called God. The very establishment of such worship shows, in its details and rites, that the philosophers who evolved those systems of nature, subjective and objective, possessed profound knowledge and were acquainted with many facts of a scientific nature. For besides being purely occult, the rites of lunar worship were based, as just shown, upon a knowledge of a physiology quite a modern science with us, psychology, sacred mathematics, geometry and metrology, and their right applications to symbols and figures, which are but glyphs recording observed natural and scientific facts, in short, upon a most minute and profound knowledge of nature. Lunar magnetism generates life, preserves and kills it. Soma embodies the triple power of the Trimurti, though it passes unrecognized by the profane to this day. The allegory that makes Soma the moon produced by the churning of the ocean of life, space, by the gods in another Manvantara, that is, in a pre-genetic day of our planetary system, and that other allegory which shows the Rishis milking the earth, whose calf was Soma, the moon, has a deep cosmographical meaning, for it is neither our earth which is milked, nor was the moon which we know the calf. Note, the earth flees for her life in the allegory before Prithu, who pursues her. She assumes the shape of a cow and, trembling with terror, runs away and hides even in the regions of Brahma. Therefore, it is not our earth. Again, in every Purana, the calf changes name. In one it is Manus Vayambhuva, in another Indra. In a third, the Himavat, Himalayas, itself, while Meru was the milker. This is a deeper allegory than one thinks. End of note. Had our wise men of science known as much of the mysteries of nature as the ancient Aryans did, they would surely never have imagined that the moon was projected from the earth. Once more, the oldest of permutations in Theogony, the son becoming his own father and the mother generated by the son, has to be remembered and taken into consideration if the symbolical language of the ancients is to be understood by us. Otherwise, mythology will be ever haunting the Orientalists as simply the disease which springs up at a peculiar stage of human culture, as Renouf gravely observes in a Hibert lecture. The ancients taught the, so to speak, auto-generation of the gods, the one divine essence, unmanifested, perpetually begetting a second self, manifested, which second self, androgynous in its nature, gives birth in an immaculate way to everything macro and microcosmical in this universe. This was shown in the circle and the diameter, or the sacred ten, a few pages back. But our Orientalists, their extreme desire to discover one homogeneous element in nature notwithstanding, will not see it cramped in their researches by such ignorance. They, the Arianists and Egyptologists, are constantly led astray from truth in their speculations. Thus, de Roger is unable to understand, in the text which he translates, the meaning of Amun-Ra saying to King Amenophis, supposed to be Memnon, Thou art my son, 
I have begotten thee. And as he finds the same idea in many a text and under various forms, this very Christian Orientalist is finally compelled to exclaim that, for this idea to have entered the mind of a hierogrammatist, there must have been in their religion a more or less defined doctrine, indicating as a possible fact that might come to pass, a divine and immaculate incarnation under a human form. Precisely, but why throw the explanation on an impossible prophecy when the whole secret is explained by the later religion copying the earlier? De Rouget still fails to account for and perceive what were the functions attributed to the feminine principle in that primordial generation. Note, his clear realization of it is that the Egyptians prophesied Jehovah, in brackets, exclamation mark, and his incarnated Redeemer, the Good Serpent, etc., etc., even to identifying Typhon with the wicked dragon of the Garden of Eden, and this passes as a serious and a sober science. End of note. He does not find it in the goddess Nath of Saiz. Yet he quotes the sentence of the commander to Cambyses when introducing that king into the Saitic temple. Quote, I made known to his majesty the dignity of Saiz, which is the abode of Nath, the great female producer, genitrix of the sun, who is the firstborn, and who is not begotten, but only brought forth, unquote. and hence is the fruit of an immaculate mother. How much more grandiose, philosophical and poetical, is the real distinction for whoever is able to understand and appreciate it, made between the immaculate virgin of the ancient pagans and the modern papal conception. With the former, the ever-youthful mother nature, the antitype of her prototypes, the sun and moon generates and brings forth her mind-born sun, the universe. The sun and moon, as male-female deities, fructify the earth, the microcosmical mother, and the latter conceives and brings forth in her turn. With the Christians, the firstborn, primogenitus, is indeed generated, that is, begotten, genitum non factum, and positively conceived and brought forth, virgo paricht, explains the Latin church. Thus, she drags down the noble spiritual ideal of the Virgin Mary to the earth, and, making her of the earth earthly, degrades that ideal to the lowest of the anthropomorphic goddesses of the rabble. Truly, Nath, Isis, Diana, etc., etc., were each of them a demiurgical goddess, at once visible and invisible, having her place in heaven, and helping to the generation of species, the moon, in short. Her occult aspects and powers are numberless, and, in one of them, the moon becomes with the Egyptian Hathor, another aspect of Isis, and both of these goddesses are shown suckling horrors. Note, Hathor is the infernal's Isis, the goddess preeminently of the West, or the netherworld. End of note. Behold, in the Egyptian hall of the British Museum, Hathor worshipped by Pharaoh Totmes, who stands between her and the Lord of Heavens. The monolith was taken from Karnak, and the same goddess has the following legend inscribed on her throne. The Divine Mother and Lady, or Queen of Heaven, also the Morning Star and the Light of the Sea, Stella Matutina and Lux Maris. All the lunar goddesses had a dual aspect, one divine, the other infernal. All were the virgin mothers of an immaculately born son, the sun. Raoul Rocchetti shows the moon goddess of the Athenians, Pallas, or Cybele, Minerva, or again Diana, holding her child son in, on the lap, invoked in her festivals as Monogenes Feui, the one mother of God, sitting on a lion and surrounded by twelve personages in whom the occultist recognizes the twelve great gods and the pious Christian Orientalist, the Apostles, or rather the Greek and pagan prophecy thereof. They are both right, 
for the immaculate goddess of the latin church is a faithful copy of the old pagan goddesses the number twelve of the apostles is that of the twelve tribes and the latter are a personification of the twelve great gods and of the twelve signs of the zodiac every detail almost in their christian dogma is borrowed from the heathens semele the wife of jupiter and the mother of bacchus the sun is according to anonus also quote, carried unquote, or made to ascend to heaven after her death where she presides between mars and venus under the name of the queen of the world or the universe panbasileia at the names of which as the names of hathor hectate and other infernal goddesses quote, tremble all the demons unquote. note this is de Mervie, who proudly confesses the similarity and he ought to know end of note semelen tremonsi daimones this greek inscription on a small temple reproduced on a stone that was found by somebody and copied by montfaucon as de Mervie tells us one hundred and thirteen archaeologie de la vierge mère informs us of the stupendous fact that the magna mater of the old world was an impudent plagiarism perpetrated by the demon of the immaculate virgin mother of his church whether so or vice versa is of no importance that which is interesting to note is the perfect identity between the archaic copy and the modern original did space permit we might show the inconceivable coolness and unconcern exhibited by certain followers of the roman catholic church when made to face the revelations of the past to maurice remark that the virgin took possession of the sanctuaries of ceres and venus and that the pagan rite proclaimed and practised in honour of those goddesses were in a good measure transferred to the mother of christ the advocate of rome answers quote, that such is the fact and that it is just as it should be and quite natural as the dogma the liturgy and the rite professed by the roman apostolical church in eighteen sixty two are found engraved on monuments inscribed on papyri and cylinders hardly posterior to the deluge it does seem impossible to deny the existence of a first anti-historical Roman Catholicism, of which our own is but the faithful continuation. But while the former was the culmination, the summum of the impudence of demons and goethic necromancy, the latter is divine. If in our Christian revelation, l'Apocalypse, Mary, clothed with the sun and having the moon under her feet, has nothing more in common with the humble servant of Nazareth. Sick! It is because she has now become the greatest of theological and cosmological powers in our universe. From Mercologie de la Vierge, pages 116 and 119, and by the Marquis de Mervie. Verily so, since Pindar's hymns to Minerva, page 19, who sits at the right hand of her father Jupiter, and who is more powerful than all the other angels or gods, are likewise applied to the Virgin. It is Saint Bernard, who, quoted by Cornelius Alapid, is made to address the Virgin Mary in this wise, quote, The Son Christ lives in thee, and thou livest in him, unquote. Sermon on the Holy Virgin again the virgin is admitted to be the moon by the same unsophisticated holy man being the lucina of the church that is in a childbirth the verse of virgil casta fove lucina tus jam regnat apollo is applied to her like the moon the virgin is the queen of heaven adds the innocent saint apocalypse chapter twelve commentary by cornelius alapid this settles the question the more similarity according to such writers as de Mervie there exists between the pagan conceptions and the Christian dogmas, the more divine appears the Christian religion, and the more is it seen to be the only truly inspired one, especially in its Roman Catholic form. The unbelieving scientists and the academicians who think they see in the Latin Church quite the opposite of divine inspiration, 
and who will not believe in the satanic tricks of plagiarism by anticipation, are severely taken to ask. But then, quote, they believe in nothing and reject even the Nabathean agriculture as a romance and a pack of superstitious nonsense, unquote, complains the memorialist. Quote, in their perverted opinion, Kutami's idol of the moon and the statue of the Madonna are one, unquote. A noble marquis wrote twenty years ago six huge volumes, or, as he calls them, Memoir to the French Academy, with the sole object of showing Roman Catholicism an inspired and revealed faith. As a proof thereof, he furnishes numberless facts, all tending to show that the entire ancient world, ever since the deluge, had been, with the help of the devil, systematically plagiarizing the rites, sermons, and dogmas of the future Holy Church to be born ages later. What would that faithful son of Rome have said had he heard his co-religionist, Monsieur Renouf, the distinguished Egyptologist of the British Museum, declaring in one of his learned lectures that, quote, neither Hebrews nor Greeks borrowed any of their ideas from Egypt, unquote. Note, quoted in Mr. G. Massey's lecture, end of note. But perhaps it is just this that M. Renouf intended to say, namely, that it is the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Aryans who borrowed theirs from the Latin Church. And if so, why, in the name of logic, do the Papists reject the additional information which the Orientalists may give them on moon worship, since it all tends to show there, the Roman Catholic, worship as old as the world of Sabaeanism and astrolatry? The reason of early Christian and later Roman Catholic astrolatry, or the symbolical worship of sun and moon, identical with that of the Gnostics, though less philosophical and pure than the sun worship of the Zoroastrians, is a natural consequence of its birth and origin. The adoption by the Latin Church of such symbols as the water, fire, sun, moon and stars and a good many other things, is simply a continuation by the early Christians of the old worship of the pagan nations. Thus Odin got his wisdom, power and knowledge by sitting at the feet of Mimir, the thrice-wise Jotun, who passed his life by the fountain of a primeval wisdom, the crystalline waters of which increased his knowledge daily. Mimir, drew the highest knowledge from the fountain, because the world was born of water, hence primeval wisdom was to be found in that mysterious element, Osgord and the gods, page 86. The eye which Odin had to pledge to acquire that knowledge may be the sun which enlightens and penetrates all things, his other eye being the moon, whose reflection gazes out of the deep, and which at last when setting, sinks into the ocean, from the same source. But it is something more besides this. Loki, the fire god, is said to have hidden in the water, as well as in the moon, the light giver, whose reflection he found therein. And this belief that the fire finds refuge in the water was not limited to the old Scandinavians. It was shared by all nations and was finally taken up by the early Christians, who symbolized the Holy Ghost under the shape of fire, cloven tongues like as fire, the breath of the Father Son. This fire descends also into the water or the sea, Mar, Mary. The dove was the symbol of the soul with several nations. It was sacred to Venus, the goddess born from the sea foam, and it became later the symbol of the Christian Anima Mundi, or the Holy Spirit. One of the most occult chapters in the Book of the Dead is chapter 80, entitled To Make the Transformation into the God, Giving Light to the Path of Darkness, wherein Woman Light of the Shadow serves Tot in his retreat in the moon. Tot Hermes is said to hide therein, because he is the representative of the secret wisdom, He is the manifested Logos of its light side, 
the concealed deity or dark wisdom when he is supposed to retire to the opposite hemisphere. Speaking of her power, the moon calls herself repeatedly the light which shineth in darkness, the woman light. Hence it became the accepted symbol of all the virgin mother goddesses. As the wicked evil spirits warred against the moon in days of yore, so they are supposed to war now, without being able to prevail, however, against the actual queen of heaven, Mary the moon. Hence also the moon was intimately connected in all the pagan theogonies with the dragon, her eternal enemy, the virgin or Madonna standing on her feet. This because the head and tail of the dragon, which represent in Eastern astronomy to this day the ascending and descending nodes of the moon, were also symbolized in ancient Greece by the two serpents. Hercules kills them on the day of his birth, and so does the babe in his virgin mother's arms. As Mr. Gerald Massey aptly observes in this connection, all such symbols figured their own facts from the first, and did not prefigure others of a total different order. The iconography, and dogmas too, had survived in Rome from a period remotely pre-Christian. There was neither forgery nor interpolation of types, nothing but a continuity of imagery with a perversion of its meaning. Next section is section 10. Tree, serpent and crocodile worship. 